Hi everyone, how are you doing today? In this video, I am going to be reading The City in the Sea by Edgar Allan Poe. This is one of my favorite poems, I think I've mentioned it in the past. As I was researching this poem, I learned that there are two previous versions of it which Poe wrote before he um, finalized it in 1845. And then there's also another poem by another poet called Musing Thoughts, which he may have plagiarized or has been accused of plagiarizing. So what I'll do is I'll read The City in the Sea, and then I'll read the original version called The Doomed City, and then I'll finish with Musing Thoughts by Lydia Sigourney and see if he really plagiarized her or not. So without further ado, let's start with The City in the Sea. Lo, death has reared himself a throne in a strange city lying alone. Far down within the dim west, where the good and the bad and the worst and the best have gone to their eternal rest. There shrines and palaces and towers, time-eaten towers that tremble not, resemble nothing that is ours, around by lifting winds forgot, resignedly beneath the sky, the melancholy waters lie. No rays from holy heaven come down on the long night-time of that town, but light from out the lurid sea streams up the turrets silently, gleams up the pinnacles far and free, up domes, up spires, up kingly halls, up fanes, up Babylon-like walls, up shadowy long-forgotten bowers of sculptured ivy and stone flowers, up many and many a marvelous shrine whose wreathed friezes intertwine, the vial, the violet, and the vine. Resignedly beneath the sky, the melancholy waters lie. So blend the turrets and shadows there that all seem pendulous in air, while from a proud tower in the town, death looks gigantically down. There open fanes and gaping graves yawn level with the luminous waves, but not the riches there that lie in each idol's diamond eye, not the gaily jeweled dead tempt the waters from their bed, for no ripples curl, alas, along that wilderness of glass, no swellings tell that winds may be upon some far-off happier sea, no heavings hint that winds have been on seas less hideously serene. But lo, a stir is in the air, the wave, there is a movement there, as if the towers thrust aside in slightly sinking the dull tide, as if their tops had feebly given a void within the filmy heaven. The waves have now a redder glow, the hours are breathing faint and low, and when, amid no earthly moans, down, down, that town shall settle hence, hell, rising from a thousand thrones, shall do it reverence. So that was The City in the Sea, published in 1845. And now I'm going to read the original version called The Doomed City, published in 1831. Lo, death hath reared himself a throne in a strange city, all alone, far down within the dim west. And the good and the bad and the worst and the best have gone to their eternal rest. Their shrines and palaces and towers are not like anything of ours. Oh no, oh no, ours never loom to heaven with that ungodly gloom. Time-eaten towers that tremble not, around by lifting winds forgot, resignedly beneath the sky the melancholy waters lie. A heaven that God doth not contemn with stars is like a diadem, we liken our lady's eyes to them, but there, that everlasting pall, it would be mockery to call such dreariness a heaven at all. Yet though no holy rays come down on the long night-time of that town, light from the lurid deep sea streams up the turrets silently, up thrones, up long-forgotten bowers of sculptured ivy and stone flowers, up domes, up spires, up kingly halls, up fanes, up Babylon-like walls, up many a melancholy shrine, 
whose entablatures entwine the mask, the vial, and the vine. Their open temples, open graves, are on a level with the waves, but not the riches there that lie in each idol's diamond eye. Not the gaily jeweled dead tempt the waters from their bed, for no ripples curl, alas, along that wilderness of glass. No swellings hint that winds may be upon a far-off happier sea. So blend the turrets and shadows there that all seem pendulous in air, while from the high towers of the town death looks gigantically down. But lo, a stir is in the air. The wave, there is a ripple there, as if the towers had thrown aside in slightly sinking the dull tide, as if the turret tops had given a vacuum in the filmy heaven. The waves have now a redder glow, the very hours are breathing low, and when amid no earthly moans, down, down that town shall settle hence, hell rising from a thousand thrones shall do it reverence, and death to some more happy clime shall give his undivided time. So those are the two versions of this poem. There was a second version in between that was very similar to the first one, so... Um, I'll link to that in the description in case you want to read that one, too. Uh, I feel like what really appeals to me about the city in the sea and the doomed city is the imagery of the sunken city. That is a long-running myth. And, you know, there's Atlantis, of course, the most famous example. But there's also a really beautiful piece by WC, the French composer, called the under underwater cathedral i believe it's called it's about this cathedral which sinks but comes up to the surface when the bells ring returning to poe this city seems to have sunk for good it has illusions of light but um, they're just illusions as he as he shows us and um, it's a spiritually dead city it has had this long-term relationship with death and uh, at the beginning he says death has reared himself a throne in a strange city lying alone and by the end of the poem in both versions um, it's almost as if that's been reflected upon the city now called a town interestingly so it's reduced in size and in uh, grandeur and he says, hell rising from a thousand thrones shall do it reverence. Interestingly, in the first version of the poem, he adds two lines that says, and death to some more happy clime shall give his undivided time. Um, so the city has been finished off and death is moving on to its next victim, which is kind of a interesting thing. That I wonder why he took that out. And the other thing I noticed about this poem is... In the beginning, he talks about how different this city is from any of ours, presumably his readership. And, and, and in the first, he's very, uh, he puts a lot of stress on this. He says, their shrines and palaces and towers are not like anything of ours. Oh no, oh no, ours never loom to heaven with that ungodly gloom. He kind of reins that back a bit in the second version, which makes me wonder... Is he saying that very literally? Is he saying that in more of a ironic sense? Um, it could be argued either way, I think. Um, the imagery is absolutely beautiful in this poem. The ruins that are so beautiful and yet uh, so forever lost in the ocean. I really think this is a very memorable poem and the way he uses the rhyme is very effective and has this kind of rhythm to it that he maintains throughout, which fits very well the ocean theme of the poem. Um, I'm going to move to the third poem now, which is called Musing Thoughts by Lydia Sigourney, a poem which he may have plagiarized the line A Thousand Thrones. Not sure if he did, but we're going to read it and see how similar or different these two poems are. But first, a word about Lydia Sigourney, because I had never heard of her before. Lydia was a female poet, an American as well. 
she published poems from the 1810s to the 1860s. And uh, she was kind of an interesting female poet because she wasn't particularly feminist in the modern sense of the word. She believed very much in traditional gender roles, um, but she was also very much in favor of women's literacy and influence through literacy. So that kind of puts her at a bit of a contrast with Mary Wollstonecraft, um, who wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Woman. I think it's very interesting. I think that Lydia must have been very accomplished for someone of her era, and uh, I would definitely be interested in reading more of her poems. But let's read Musing Thoughts, which was published in 1829. I did not dream, and yet untiring thought rang such wild changes on the spirit's harp. It seemed that slumber ruled. A structure rose, deep-founded and gigantic, strangely blent, its orders seemed. The dusky gothic tower ecclesiastical, the turret proud, in castellated pomp, the palace dome, the grated dungeon and the peasant's cot were grouped within its walls. A throne was there, a king with all his gay and courtly train, in robes of splendor, and a vassal throng, eager to do his will, and pleased with chains of gilded servitude. The background seemed darkened by misery's pencil. Famine cast a tinge of paleness o'er the brow of toil, while poverty to soothe her naked babes shrieked forth a broken song. Then came a groan, a rush as if of thunder, and the earth from yawning clefts breathed forth volcanic flames, while the huge fabric rocking to its base a ruin seemed. A miserable mass of tortured life rolled through the burning gates and spread terrific o'er the parching soil like blackened lava. Then there was a pause, as if the dire convulsion mourned its wreck, to the rent walls the sad survivors clung, and even mid smouldering fires the artificers wrought to uprear the pile. But all at once a bugle blast was heard, a courser's tramp, while a stern warrior waved his sword and cried, Away, away! Like dreams the pageant fled, monarch and royal dame and nobles proud. So there he stood alone, arrayed in power, supreme and self-derived. Where the rude Alps mock with their battlements the bowing cloud, his eagle banner streamed, pale Gallia poured incense as to an idol, mixed with blood of her young conscript hearts. Chained in wild wrath, the Austrian lion couched, even Caesar's realm cast down its crown pontifical, and bade the eternal city lay her lip in dust. The land of pyramids bent darkly down, and from the subject nations rose a voice of wretchedness, that awed the trembling globe. Earth, slowly rising from her thousand thrones, did homage to the Corsican, as he, the favored patriarch, in his dream beheld heaven, with her sceptered blazonry of stars, bow to a reaper's sheaf. But fickle man, though like the sea he boasts himself a while, hath bounds to his supremacy. I saw a listed field where the embattled kings drew in deep wrath their armored legions on. The self-crowned warrior blenched not, and his sword gleamed like the flashing lightning when it cleaves the vaulted firmament. In vain, in vain, the hour of fate had come. From a fair isle against whose bold rocks the foiled Pacific roars, I heard above the troubled surge the moan of a chafed spirit warring with its lot. And there, where every element conspired, to make ambition's prison doubly sure, the mighty warrior gnawed his chain and died. So this is a very different poem in terms of subject matter. The first section of the poem, the first half of it, is very symbolic in nature. It's got the, the king and his subjects and poverty personified as a mother and uh, this this idea of wretchedness of the people and of the king. And then finally we have this volcanic eruption, this earth being torn apart. And from, from this eruption and the earthquake comes this warrior. And then the poem pivots into the second half, which is one big stanza. And here she paints the picture of Napoleon crossing the Alps 
the defeat of Austria, the invasion of Rome, and his campaign in Egypt as well. And uh, the various nations being conquered by Napoleon and finally his death on the Isle of St. Helena. So I can see some mild similarities with the city in the sea. And of course there is that one phrase, uh, thousand thrones, which you could say perhaps he intentionally or unintentionally took from this poem. Um, but I feel like these are different poems. Pose is more about a more universal sense of destruction and death and folly. And this poem is very much about Napoleon, I think, specifically. Um, although she could have gone in a more universal direction if she wanted to. But this was written in, or published in 1829, so that would have been eight years after Napoleon's death. So the uh, wounds of the Napoleonic Wars would have been still pretty fresh in people's minds. I wasn't able to find much information about this poem, but I thought it was interesting. I thought it was worth reading, and I'm a bit of a Napoleonic Wars nerd, so I was excited to find something about that through Edgar Allan Poe. Um, let me know your thoughts on these poems. I have another couple of ideas for poems I could read and talk about, which I may share in the future. So thanks for watching. Please like the video if you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.